Aujourd'hui, aujourd le, le thème principal est le déploiement clinique de l'intelligence artificielle en imagerie médicale. Et donc, vous voyez que ce thème, vraiment, l'imagerie médicale est le domaine où euh, l'intelligence artificielle euh, fait des progrès et fait avancer les choses. Euh, alors, ce thème sera développé par un éminent conférencier, euh, un professeur, le professeur Mathieu Longren. J'espère que je prononce bien le nom. Euh, sinon, en fin de oui. séance, c'est quand même une belle leçon. Oui. Et donc, le professeur Longren, qui est membre associé du centre de Stanford pour l'intelligence artificielle en médecine et en imagerie, cherche, chercheur clinique principal, en intelligence artificielle, machine learning, Amazon Word, public secteur health. Donc, c'est vraiment un éminent professeur dans le domaine et qui va parcourir, je pense que tous les participants le comprennent, vraiment ce domaine qui est d'actualité et qui est fort important pour nous. Si le professeur est prêt, voilà, je vous donne la parole pour votre conférence qui est vraiment attendue. Merci, professeur. Thank you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. I'm going to uh, share my screen here in just a moment, but I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, I was very uh, excited to see this invitation come across uh, my desk uh, a while ago. And, and like I said, I think there was um, just a, a variety of things that I, I wanted to talk to you all about, um, just, share, just share the things that I've uh, learned over the last you know eight or ten years, both in my time uh, as a professor at Stanford and also uh, uh, during my time now in, in in sort of a tech company, which uh, has given me a, a different perspective on some of these things as well. Uh, but I think you know uh, one of the things that I've been passionate about since the very beginning is uh, is the opportunity to uh, to bring together a global community to to uh to sort of both help and and work together uh towards identifying things that we can solve as a global community uh and we can all speak a common language in both medicine and computer science uh because there are aspects of both medicine and computer science that transcend politics and governments and, and where you are in the world and i find that very very interesting and very inspiring um, and I, I've been working very hard since the beginning of my career to find ways to share the things that I've learned uh, very, in a very open way. So both the good and the bad, uh, but also the data and the education uh, resources that you know, I found useful or the things that we've done in our work, trying to make that available to as many people as possible. Uh, because you know, it, really what we've found is that it's not uh, really a, a lack of, uh, of interest. It's actually uh, simply a lack of access to data. And in some cases, uh, some of the educational materials, which you know, I'm inspired by my colleagues at Stanford who have done a lot of work in the open source education community like Andrew Ang and Fei-Fei Li and others. And, and so I'm hoping to continue to uh, contribute to that spirit. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to kind of walk through some some key things that I've worked on that uh, I think will resonate, I think potentially with, with this group. And uh, I'll save plenty of time at the end uh, for you know, a conversation, happy to answer questions. Um, and, and again, I, I'm just as excited to, to learn from you as, as hopefully you are to, to hear what I'm talking about today. So um, with that, <laughs> I'm gonna start with something that you probably have seen before uh, in various parts of uh, you know the different areas of commercial and, and other uh, academics, but we talk a lot about what's called the hype cycle, and this is sort of where uh, there's an innovation, and then you, you, on this side you can kind of see there's these expectations, and then you get really excited about something new, right? And you think about all the possibilities of what what this technology could do, this new technology, and then there's this moment of uh, where, where things aren't exactly meeting your expectations. Uh, and and, and there's, this, there's this thing we call the trough of disillusionment where uh, you think, ah, this isn't gonna work. Nothing seems to be going the way we thought. Um, but, but it's actually, that's the critical piece because in the attempt, we are learning about 
where it works, where it doesn't, what needs to be done, but we're learning as we're doing. And then you kind of head up this slope of enlightenment, as we call it, to get to a place where the things that we can do with the technology meet expectations of uh, of the groups that are, you know, sort of using it and, de and deploying it. So um, when I think about that, I, I kind of try to track where academic science is. And I think we're pretty much at the peak <laughs> of, uh, of, of the excitement. Um, and now we're starting to learn about things that uh, aren't working as well as we thought. And, and that's okay, because we're gonna talk about that today and, and what we need to do. The other way you can look at this hype cycle is with money. Um, and we've seen a massive investment in uh, AI and medical imaging uh, globally. Uh, up to two billion or so, at least, is is expected to be invested in specifically just AI and radiology. Although it gets much larger when you think about AI in all aspects of healthcare. So I, I think we're still probably there as well as you as you may see, or if you follow uh, the economics of of this space, you can sense that maybe there's going to be a, a bit of a shift into uh, investments in things that actually work um, and aren't just really cool. Um, so when I, when I started to look at, uh, radiology and when I learned enough about computer science and worked with my colleagues, we, we started to break down each part of the radiology life cycle. So you order a test, you have to, you know, an MRI or CT, you have to reconstruct the image in a certain way. You have to check the quality. You have to decide, is it important? Uh, is there an important finding, right? Um, we have to classify it or make a diagnosis, right? And you kind of, and there's a cycle that, that happens. And in each of these steps, there are opportunities for AI. There are companies that have built solutions in each of these steps. And then there's um, additional steps where we've seen groups that have been able to use AI and deep learning for uh, reconstruction purposes. So in other words, the raw data from an MRI scanner, we can reconstruct that into an image we can interpret faster or potentially more accurately, right? Um, and, and then there's this other pathway that we've started to see and, and I'm really excited about, which is that um, we can take the imaging data that we already acquire and we can use it to get insights that humans can't get uh, to help take care of our patients. And I'm gonna talk about a use case today that, that I'm especially excited about for, for that. But then, you know, as we uh, learned at the center, and I'll talk about this again today as well, there's a different perspective on AI and radiology, which is that of the clinicians who are ordering the imaging tests or they're potentially using the imaging, but they're not radiologists. And I just kind of put this into a category of clinicians, right? Clinicians that take care of patients uh, that they may order uh, imaging examinations for, but they may not necessarily be in responsible for the interpretation. And we're starting to see a lot of opportunities uh, for leveraging some of the tools that can pull out important information um, rather than sort of give that information to a radiologist we're starting to find opportunities to give that information instead to the clinician directly. And I'm gonna talk about some of that as well. Um, for those of you who are uh, familiar with AI and radiology, I think there's a very simple construct that we all uh, sort of have in mind, which is that there's an imaging examination, like a chest X-ray or a elbow X-ray or whatever, and the job or the task is simply to apply AI to that and have it give you the answer. But if, but those of you who are radiologists uh, know that that's not, that's not really exactly what we do in its entirety, right? There's actually more to our job, more to our training than just the single image. And what folks are starting to realize is that uh, there's, there's something we're calling the cognitive work of radiology. So what are our brains actually doing when we're doing our radiology work. And one of the things that we do in addition to that image is we also look at clinical context. So uh, we uh, review the chart, we look at the patient history, we uh, 
you know, kind of think we're all physicians. So we're kind of acting as physicians in addition to just looking at the image. And that's something that currently very, very, very few AI models have been built to do. Most AI models are built to just look at the imaging study itself. But then there's something else that we do. We also look at other images, right? So you may have a chest x-ray from today, but we also need to know what your last chest x-ray looked like or what your CT scan last time looked like. Um, and so in addition to the clinical information and the last images, we have to put this whole thing together. And then the final thing that we do is that we are physicians. So we actually recommend treatment. Um, we actually help our clinician colleagues decide what the best thing to do uh, is for that patient. But remember that to do all of these things in, with AI is, is still science, right? We haven't gotten to a place where all of this stuff can be done comprehensively. And that's one of the critical reasons why some of the applications that we've seen are not meeting expectations because they're simply looking at the single image. The other thing I like to talk about is the fact that, and we'll touch on this again later, is that you know, we are building solutions uh, both in you know, science and academia, but also in the commercial space that are meant for radiologists. But the distribution of radiologists around the world is very asymmetric. And if we are only using our scientific work to aid a radiologist, then we miss out on the opportunity to find better ways to leverage that information to places that don't have a radiologist as, as frequently as some other parts of the world. So we need to reshift our focus and I'll talk about a use case on that too. Um, when I think about uh, who is going to be the innovators in this space, um, you, you can compare you know, small companies, you can compare large companies, you can compare uh, sort of large healthcare delivery systems, pharma, pharmaceutical companies. But, but what I really believe is that groups that have a university that are affiliated with a hospital, that together is the best place for true innovation and true impact. Because if you can't have good access to clinicians and data to, to pair with computer scientists, it's very difficult to be successful. And so that's kind of the background into what we did uh, to when we built the uh, center at Stanford called the Amy Center. Um, we had a mission to, uh, to improve healthcare across the spectrum, but we added this last bit in at the end because we had to make a decision. Do we want to build something just for Stanford, just for Stanford patients, or do we wanna build something that is open and accessible to anyone in the world. And, and we opted for the latter, even though it was slightly more difficult uh, and, and sometimes uh, counterproductive for, for our purposes, we ultimately found that this was the best approach uh, to driving serious impact. And so when we put the center together, these are the things that we thought about the most. Uh, we wanted to see, number one, we wanted to see collaborations that were between scientists in computer science and engineering with clinicians in all different specialties, uh, physicians. And we needed to find a way to bring them together as a community. Um, but to do that, we needed to have uh, very good educational opportunities. We needed to find ways to uh, give them the tools to communicate with each other. Um, and then we wanted to not just build things, and talk about them, we wanted to actually use them and test them out. So we needed to make sure that we were, had a clinical infrastructure to deploy these systems to see how they worked. Uh, and then finally, uh, we needed to fund it, right? So we needed to have an opportunity and a, and a mechanism to raise money uh, in order to help our scientists uh, achieve, their, achieve their goals. So our center started in 2017. Uh, with two people. <laughs> it was myself and, and Dr. Kurt Langlotz, uh, and we had an idea. Um, and uh, within four years, we had 170 faculty across Stanford in all different parts of the university and all different parts of healthcare. And it really spoke to the fact that we focused on community first, 
and uh, and collaboration as a priority. And we really, really focused on saying, if you're going to work with us together, that the resources that you're building, the students that you're working with, the data sets that you're working with need to be a community asset. So we all need to be able to, to share and use that. And that, that was very important to us. We did collaborate with industry, but we were very clear that we will not sell any medical data to anyone. Uh, they, we, certainly we've been asked, uh, you know, at Stanford to, can, you, can we buy, you know, CT scans of, of patients? We, we, we had to make a decision that that is not something that we wanted to do because we felt like it would give unfair advantage and really probably doesn't keep with the promises we make to our patients that the data that we generate will be used for the greater good to benefit everybody, not just the company or the group that has the most money. And that was a decision we make, and I'll talk to you about why that was important. But what we did use the collaboration and the funding for was to uh, fund science. We, uh, we were able to provide resources to scientists across Stanford and even outside of Stanford to, uh, to, to think about innovative collaborative ways that AI could be used to drive patient care. And so uh, we funded, this is just one example, we had, we had several cycles of this grant program and the innovations that come out of that uh, were much more valuable than just, for example, a data exchange for, you know, for, for, for a particular project. And, and we really were excited about that uh, and how that's driven really more scientists to do this work in our ecosystem. We, um, we published a lot. That is something that's important to us in the academic world. It's our currency, uh, so to speak. And it's also the way that we communicate the findings. But when we publish, we were very, very focused on making the, the code for the algorithms and the data as open as possible so that anyone anywhere in the world would be able to access the code or the data itself, as I'll talk about, and reproduce our work. And in a lot of cases, do better than what we did. Um, and that was for us validation of the power of the community of scientists around the world. If they're given the tools and, 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 the, and of course the data, they can achieve really creative solutions to problems that we never imagined. And, and just, to, just to put a finer point on it, we release data. We have a, you can go to our website and you can look at the different data sets available. This is a small sample. We have many more now. Uh, we have the largest number of medical imaging data available to anybody in the world without any charge. <laughs> um, and they're all labeled uh, just like they were for a deep learning project or a paper. And these data sets can be used for by anyone in the research and education communities to build models of their own and to publish their own work or to potentially even drive towards a future use case of, of building a model to put in their hospital. So I wanna spend a minute to talk about why we thought releasing data was so important. And just to put a sort of a point on it, we, we've noticed, and I'm sure you have too, that medical data is expanding very rapidly, right? It's becoming even hard to store all of the data. Um, and it's very difficult to imagine a world where uh, we're going to have less data at all, right? It's only going to continue to increase. So what, why is it so important? If you ask any of our scientists at Stanford, uh, what took the longest, what was the hardest part of your deep learning work? They will tell you that 80 to 90% of the effort was data related. It was getting the data, organizing the data, labeling the data, uh, and eventually trying to find a way to learn how exactly that data translates into a clinical use case. The model building, the model training, the architecture, that stuff wasn't too hard. I mean, relative to the difficulty getting access to data. And I think that would, that's, a, that's an opinion that most people share. And so I want to tell a story about why data has been so important to this field. And I'm going to do this with a couple of examples. So I, I don't know if any of you 
recognize this photograph. Um, I have a lot of gray hair, so I was around when this happened, but this was from, this is from the late nineties. This was when uh, Gary Kasparov, uh, the famous chess player lost to Deep Blue, right? That was the first time a computer beat a human in chess. And I was in high school, I was, you know, it was, I wasn't that old time, but I do remember that everyone started to talk about how the computers are taking over and, and we're all, we're all going to be, you know, uh, we're all going to be living in the future, right? Immediately, the computers were smarter than humans. And I assumed at the time that, that it must have been some new algorithm that was invented that made this possible. But when you look at the timeline, so this, this event occurred in 1997, but the algorithm that was used to do this was actually quite old. It was 14 years old at the time. It wasn't a new innovation. What made this possible was the data. And in 1991, the largest data set of chess games ever, ever compiled was released. And when that data set was curated and made available, it took only six years to use that algorithm to beat a human. And if you ask anyone who was on that team at the time, they will say that the only reason that happened is because of that data set being available. I'm gonna use another example. Uh, this one you might remember. Uh, this is uh, Watson beating uh, all the Jeopardy champions, right, at, at the game Jeopardy. This happened in 2011, uh, another big event where people talked about computers being smarter than humans, right? Um, and I, again, assumed that there must have been some breakthrough in algorithms that made this possible. But actually, the algorithm that was used to do that was 20 years old at the time. It wasn't new. And they had tried for years and years to beat humans and they didn't come close until the largest data set of generalized knowledge in Wikipedia and Project Gutenberg, which is you know, the digitization of books. When that was made available to this algorithm, it was able to learn enough to beat humans in just two years. It wasn't the algorithm, it was the data. That's how important data is to this field. And yes, there are new techniques to minimize the need for data, but I have yet to see an innovation that didn't require massive amounts of data and compute to achieve that next level of, 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 of accomplishment. Finally, I have uh, the example of ImageNet, which all of you I'm sure are familiar with, right? Uh, this is from Fei Fei Lee's group. Millions and millions of images uh, were released uh, for the general public to use. And there was a competition for computer scientists to use that data to try to beat human performance in classifying images like cats and dogs and you know bugs and plants. And Microsoft was the first to do this in 2015 where they beat human performance on classifying light, you know, natural images. But just like the other examples, the convolutional neural network was also not new. It had been around for a long time. It just didn't have enough data uh, and, and in some cases compute to really achieve it. Um, but once ImageNet was created and released, the repurposing of that convolutional neural network architecture allowed this incredible achievement to happen. In fact, it's what we owe all of this stuff that we're talking about today. So this is why data is so important. It's driving everything that we do. Um, and people have called it the new oil. Um, and this is why people that look like this are starting to ask about data all the time, every industry, and especially in healthcare. But I disagree that data is oil because data isn't a consumable resource, right? Digital data, uh, no one is necessarily excluded from using it. And just because one person uses it doesn't mean someone else can't use it. Um, and the WHO agrees with me and the World Economic Forum agrees with me and the UN agrees with me. And I think that most people have started to realize that this valuable asset is a benefit for all and it can be seen as a public good. And what makes data valuable is actually not in its inherent properties, but it's actually is who controls access to that data. And if you need lots of data to, to achieve breakthroughs in the field, but you silo that data and you keep it locked down and fragmented across systems, across countries, across populations, then nobody wins, right? Nobody wins. 
we need to find a mechanism by which we have the ability to share data safely and ethically in the quantities and proportions that we need to drive innovation in this field. And so we look at the different ways of thinking about medical data, and this is a very sensitive topic. Some people believe that patients own their data and no one can share it without their permission. Some people believe that the hospitals own the data and it's up to them what to do with the data. They can sell it if they want to. But we believe in this fiduciary model where anyone who interacts with the data become data stewards. They're responsible to both the patients, but also to society to make a decision. Will this data help impact the greater good? Will we come up with innovations if it's made available that can help all of us and help all of our healthcare systems? And that's kind of what we believe. So this medical data as a public good concept is getting a lot of traction. And I'm sure many of you have heard discussions on various governmental and intercontinental societies discussing where exactly data can fit in, how we can make it safely and ethically available, how do we make it fair? How do we make it so that not just one country's data is used to build algorithms that don't work in other countries? That's not a fair system. We have to find ways to make data available to drive these innovations. One of the ways that we've talked about doing this responsibly is that we are trying to release data sets with the information the data uh, contains because it's very sometimes difficult for someone who's not in the medical field to understand what exactly is in that data set. Um, and we've talked about, this is actually a, a screenshot from a paper from Duke University that uh, has talked about saying, can we create just like we do for drugs, a card or an informational pamphlet that shows what's in the data, where are the blind spots, where are the biases, and if you build a model, where does it work, where does it fail? Just like a drug. The other thing that we've done with data is not just to make it available, but to, to, but to be a part of a challenge like ImageNet. Because if I'm in the community and I don't know about how to use the data or how to how to know if I'm doing a good job of, of you know, achieving a certain target, then I, I kind of, it's not very easy to engage with me. But what we've done is we've participated in large national and international competitions to make our data available to computer scientists all over the world to compete, to see who can come up with the best approach to solving a clinical problem. And we've found year after year that the best solutions are coming from places all over the world, from computer scientists who are new sometimes to medicine, but they have an innovative idea about how to solve a clinical problem with AI. And that's been fascinating. And they've used data to do that. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about education. Um, so, you know, when we first built our center, we wanted to have people from engineering, from statistics, from ethics, from law. Uh, we wanted to have um, certainly clinicians of all specialties. We wanted everyone to come together. And we did that with various educational opportunities. We opened up uh, a lot of this to the public on YouTube. Uh, we held office hours where anyone could come and ask us questions. Uh, if they needed some, to know something in, in a specific area, we would get a clinician to come and help answer. So we really created this community and that was so important. And I urge any of you in this field to find an opportunity either to build or to join a community like this. But what we kept hearing from our doctors is that they didn't, they were kind of scared about AI because it was, it, there's a lot of math, right? They don't know how to code is what we heard a lot. They, they didn't, they weren't sure if they would be able to help or contribute because they didn't know how to code um, they weren't computer scientists, right? They were, they were doctors um, and they didn't like calculus or math. <laughs> and so when they saw equations like this in their medical journals, they got a little scared and, and they said, I don't know if I can, I can be a part of this community because I don't know math. Uh, this was the reaction we often saw. They just like, ah, I'm, I'm not gonna do this. I'm, I don't wanna, I don't wanna look at math. But what we tried to tell them was that you don't need to know how to code and you don't need to know how to do advanced calculus to work in machine learning. And here's why. So I'm a radiologist. I can interpret an MRI scan. Uh, I don't know how to build an MRI machine. 
I couldn't tell you even how to start. I don't have any idea. But what I can tell you is that I understand the principles and the fundamentals of how an MRI works, where it is successful, where it doesn't work, for example, air or metal, right? I, I understand the principles of MRI. I can't build an MRI machine, but I can use it as a tool for a clinical problem. And that's how we approach this course. We, Sarita Young and I put together a course for people from the clinical background, from a non-computer scientist background. This was a course that taught the fundamentals and the principles to Stanford and eventually we released it on Coursera. And what we've been able to do is teach a lot of the principles so that you understand the language and you understand, hey, I think I, I get it. So now I can start saying where in my clinical world can I apply that knowledge? I don't need to code. I don't need to do math to do that, but I can at least say, here's a problem in my clinical workday that I could potentially apply some of these AI principles to. And that's really where we focused on that. All right, so when we built the center, it was initially a lot of computer scientists and radiologists, right? But what we were surprised by was that we were building these AI systems for radiologists and it wasn't always a radiologist that was interested in using it. So let's say we built a model that could detect a brain tumor or we could model that could detect pneumonia. The people that wanted to use them weren't just radiologists, they were clinicians, right? They were neurosurgeons and they were primary care physicians and they were emergency room doctors. They wanted to use radiology AI for themselves. And that's the first time we had ever thought about that. And my colleague, Kurt Langlotz from Stanford, uh, who famously tweeted out that AI will not replace radiologists, but radiologists who use AI will replace radiologists who don't use AI. That's the, that's the general thought. But where I start to have questions about that is where I, when I look at the distribution of the population. So if you tell an American that 95% of the world doesn't live in America, uh, they're surprised. <laughs> it's, a, it's always a surprise to an American to realize that most of the world does not live here. Um, uh, and, and in fact, if we're going to build solutions for people that uh, will actually impact global health, you start to look at why is there so much effort spent on US and Europe? And that's because we spend the most money on healthcare. So if you're making a large investment, naturally, this is where you're going to spend your time. But that doesn't make sense to me, because if we want to have the biggest possible impact, you wouldn't spend all of your time in the US and Europe, right? You'd be looking at this map that I showed you earlier. Where do we need to, where do we need to have the greatest impact? And if we're building things just for radiologists, we're not going to reach 90% of the world. So I change this a little bit. And I say that clinicians who can use AI will be the ultimate winners in some of these spaces. And, and that's where we started a project with, uh, with the University of Cape Town. So uh, there was a group of uh, pulmonologists, so they were lung doctors, they were not radiologists, who had a, a TB clinic in South Africa. And what they had a problem with was that they couldn't find any radiologists to help them. They, they were just, there was just too short shortage, too much of a shortage. There weren't enough radiologists to, to help them interpret their chest x-rays for their, for their patients. And what they wanted us to help them with is develop a system that could help them read a chest x-ray without needing a radiologist. And so we built a tool with them to look at the uh, x-ray and provide information as to whether there was likely TB. And it also looked at the clinical data, which I told you earlier was important to know the clinical information. And um, this was led by Pranav Rajprakar. Um, and what we found was this. So the accuracy without the AI system was pretty low. This line is about where an expert South African radiologist is for this task. It's a difficult task, right? Um, but when they use that, actually, this, this is true. I tried to take, uh, I tried to look at these x-rays, uh, but because I don't see TB in my clinic, my performance was actually pretty poor. <laughs> um, even though I'm a radiologist, it was difficult. But what we found was when the 
uh, pulmonologists use this tool, their accuracy exceeded that of the radiologists in their area, which was very exciting for us because it allowed them to potentially have the opportunity to interpret chest x-rays for their patients without needing to have a radiologist in the loop at all times. The other thing that we found was that when we talk about deployment, so we built a model, now we wanna get it out in the world and see how it performs. There's a big difference in infrastructure depending on where you are in the world, right? Some, some places have digital imaging, some places have film. In fact, most places that we ran into in different parts of the world that we interacted with, we're still you know, printing out or potentially even processing film. So we said, what tool could we use that could work everywhere, whether you had a screen or a film or whatever? What could we use? And we decided on the smartphone, right? We know that the smart, there's more smartphones across the world than almost any other piece of technology. And the access to smartphones has gotten to the point where uh, it's practically ubiquitous. And we looked at the literature to say, do doctors and nurses, do they use smartphones now for their work? Does anyone do that? And of course, the answer is yes. In fact, a lot of physicians take pictures of radiology studies with their smartphone camera, and they send it to a radiologist sometimes, or right, they send it for, hey, can you look at this for me uh, and, and tell me what you see? And if half doc, and this is, a, this is actually data from the, the, the NHS in the UK. Then the question is, is if you send someone a picture on a smartphone, does that mean that they're, it's gonna be a bad diagnosis? Are they gonna have a hard time telling you what's on that study? And what we found was that the, there was no significant difference between a radiologist looking at a smartphone picture of an X-ray versus looking at it on their native packs. Like they could make the main important diagnoses on a WhatsApp message, right? That's pretty interesting, right? It's interesting data. So what we decided to do is if a human could look at a smartphone photo or message of an X-ray and make a diagnosis, maybe an AI system could do the same thing. So this is actually one of our students, uh, Anoush Parikh, who is taking thousands of pictures <laughs> of films of x-rays to build a data set. And one of the first things we realized that if you take a picture with a smartphone of a screen of an x-ray versus a film of an x-ray, you're gonna get very different artifacts, right? You can see this kind of wavy rainbow kind of artifact. Uh, that's called Moray artifact. And that actually causes a problem for the model to make an interpretation, right? Humans don't have a problem with it because we can we can we know that's not uh, we know that's an artifact, but it, but but an AI model doesn't. Over here, you can see this glare from the lights, right, uh, and some of this different sort of look of the film. That's actually problematic for any AI model that's been trained on different types of data. And we had to find ways to create a data set for our models to to be able to make the interpretation without uh, getting fooled by the artifacts. So we created a large data set uh, of all kinds of different artifacts to help our models be robust against these, uh, these artifacts on the, on the smartphone cameras. And uh, this is known as instability fixing. Uh, this was led by Sharon Zhao, who's recently graduated uh, a year or two ago from, from PhD at Stanford. And, and by doing that, what we did was we actually created something called Chex Photo. This is a data set that anyone can, can download it's thousands of pictures of x-rays with a smartphone camera, different models of smartphone cameras, so that you can train a model to use smartphone images to make interpretations of x-rays. And this is again, work led by Pranaj Raj Bakar, who's now at Harvard. Um, and what we found in general is that these models could be robust against artifacts. They were able to make five or six important diagnoses, even if you took a picture of a film or a, or a screen and could potentially be pushed to the edge with, with certain approaches. So that's really exciting, right? So can we, can we leverage the power of that computer in our pocket to, uh, to democratize these algorithms to anyone in the world who wants to use them? And there's a lot of work going on in that space right now. Okay, one other thing I wanna quickly talk about is how we can use data that we already acquire for new purposes. So cardiovascular disease, 
this is from the US perspective, it's definitely a global problem, is, uh, is incredibly uh, lethal. And there's something called an Agatson score that's used for determining whether your coronary artery calcium is high enough to be at very high risk of heart disease. And if you, or if you are treated with a very inexpensive drug, a statin, you can reduce the risk of death by a lot. And it's a very cheap intervention. The problem is in the US that insurance doesn't cover these expensive types of coronary scans, right? Um, but at the same time, we perform millions of chest CTs for lung disease, and we don't look at the heart specifically for coronary disease, right? And when you ask a human expert, can you tell me the Agatson score on that lung cancer CT from the, can you look at the heart and tell me they, they can't, right? There's a lot of motion. It's a, it's a different kind of exam. We can't tell you the quantitative amount of coronary artery calcium on a, on a chest CT for lungs. But maybe an AI model could. And if an AI model could do something that humans can't, we could identify a lot of patients who are at risk of dying of cardiac disease and then treat them and reduce mortality. So that's what we did. We built a model and that looked at this scan on the left, which is all that motion that a human cannot tell you the quantity of coronary artery calcium. And we trained it with the labels from the types of studies that use specific cardiac gating that can quantify that coronary calcium. And then we taught the model to look at this to give us the answer that it would have gotten from that. And we published this work because what's so important about this is that all over the world, people are getting chest CTs for all kinds of reasons, but you can't tell them specifically on those scans if they're at high risk for dying of cardiovascular disease. You can, give, you can just say there's some calcium there or there's a lot of calcium, but you can't quantify it. But if with this model, you can quantify and actually treat somebody based on evidence-based guidelines, this is a massive opportunity for public health. And the way this works is we go to a hospital system that has a lot of CTs and we, we deploy our algorithm on those and we find patients who have a lot of coronary, that have this Agatson score of coronary disease. And we look in their chart, do you have, are you on a statin? Are you being treated? And if they're not, there's an alert that's sent to them to go see their physician and be treated for co preventative cardiology. So statins, blood pressure control, maybe anti-lipid therapy. These are cheap interventions compared to heart attacks, right? And strokes. This is an opportunity to find those patients who are underdiagnosed in our system, anywhere in the world can potentially use this on a chest CT and actually drive better outcomes for populations. Um, I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly in the interest of time, but I wanted to, to also talk to you about, for those of you in the audience that are computer scientists, you'll, you, you might find this very interesting. Um, when I talked earlier about needing to use more than just the pixels to develop good models, that should not make sense to you because if, you, if you've seen the self-driving community uh, or even facial recognition, there are ways to use other information besides the pixels to get the best model. And we do this in healthcare, right? We look at history, like I told you, or uh, where the patient's coming from to make a diagnosis. And so what we did was we actually looked in the literature to say how many groups have looked at pixel data plus other data together to see if models get better. Um, and what we found was that there's a few types of, of models that can be used to combine different data types. So this is a way that you can fuse pixel data and non-pixel data together to create one model that can work off different modalities of information. And we broke it down like this. We published this work. You're welcome to look at that. But what we tried was we took a CT model and we took an EHR model separately. And we said, let's fuse them together and see what happens, right? And what we found was our vision-only model and our EHR-only model, when we combined them together, did very well. And that was a very interesting signal to us that if we can provide these imaging-based models with clinical context, they're going to perform better for, for all kinds of different use cases. And so we published this work, and you're welcome to look. We have the data has been released for this, as well as the models. Um, one last thing I'll talk about quickly is uh, a collaboration with a pulmonologist. 
Uh, this is Nat Dean from Intermountain Healthcare, and he created a decision support tool that he had uh, some questions about. And this is our data exchange happening in real time. Um, and what he had built was a clinical decision support system that might be familiar with to you, which is it takes electronic health record data and combines it with the report of the x-ray to tell somebody how to treat a patient with pneumonia. And what he showed was that if you use this system, you can reduce mortality by 30%, right? It's pretty good. But there weren't very many doctors using it. And he couldn't understand why. If this thing made patients feel better, why wasn't anyone using it? And, and what he found was this. When patients were seeing their doctors, they were ordering their tests, and then they were waiting, right? They ordered the tests, they got the blood work back, they got the vital signs. Now they're waiting for the radiology report to make a decision, right? And that's because the radiologist was very busy. Our, we don't have enough radiologists in this country to, to, to produce very fast turnaround on every exam, right? And so everyone seems to be focusing models on these radiologists. We said, what if we just built a model that worked only for that clinician to help them make that quick decision. So when you looked at what they were doing in the current state, they had this six hour, sometimes 24 hour wait to get the report that they needed to, to decide how to treat a patient. And what we did was we put in our AI model to extract that information from the x-ray and it did it within a second, less than a second. And so now the, they weren't waiting at all anymore. They were getting the information they needed right away on how to treat someone with pneumonia. We've actually started a clinical trial on that project, but it's another example of how can we think about the broader ecosystem and not just the radiologist. And that brings me to some challenges <laughs> that I'm gonna spend the last few minutes on. We have a lot of decisions to make in our world about how to use AI systems that are built, right? We can choose amongst a lot of different companies. We can build our own. Uh, we have to decide on which use case we want to prioritize. We have to validate that it works with our patients and our populations. And then finally, we have to integrate it. Do we have the systems to integrate this into our healthcare practices? And what you're going to see from a lot of different vendors and a lot of different companies, and even in your, in your own practices, is that you build models, you evaluate them, you test them out on your system, and you deploy them. That's hard enough, but there's one very important step that's missing. And that's actually how the model does after you deploy it. Because these systems are not like software. They change over time. The data that it sees changes over time. And if you don't have a way to check on the health of the model after you've used it over time, you're going to potentially cause a lot of harm in your populations and the model may stop working. And what I try to tell hospitals, and this is a graphic from a company called evidently.ai, is that just because you can say the model's working, like that it's actually running, it's not crashing, doesn't mean you're not actually paying attention to all these other important things that we can't do right now in healthcare. And this is, this is something that is an active area of science for all of us. It's something that we all care about as we deploy these systems. And we look to other industries to say, how do we do this? So this is an example from Netflix. When, if any of you have Netflix, that algorithm that's deciding which show or movie to show you is being monitored all the time. And it's gonna help you decide based on your past choices, would you like this movie or not, right? That's, and that's an algorithm that's constantly running, okay? In healthcare, when we deploy, for example, a model that says you have a brain bleed, we don't update it, we just deploy it. We don't check on it very often. We don't have really good systems to do that. And so what I'm trying to say is that there are better systems to decide which movie you watch than systems that help you understand your emergency in a medical situation. That doesn't seem right to me. And so I think that one of the biggest areas of science for those of you looking to, uh, to continue to in your studies or potentially even do more research is to look at how we can monitor healthcare systems in practice, in production, and make sure they're safe. Uh, I'm gonna run through this very fast because it's a little busy, but this is how complicated our system at Stanford is. We have both a clinical and a laboratory environment. We take our data, we move it over to the laboratory environment, we build models and use models, we bring in vendors 
we test everything out and then we bring it back into practice. But this flywheel is incredibly important to think about as you're building your healthcare system or thinking about your infrastructure. And I'm happy to talk to anyone else offline about some details about this if, that, if that's something that interests you. Um, with the last minute or so I have, I wanted to also mention some other areas like federated learning, which I'm sure you've heard about, which is the opportunity to not have to share your data because maybe your government restrictions, maybe you have hospital restrictions, maybe patient privacy restrictions. But federated learning allows you to move the model between the hospitals and not move the data. And the final model can still learn from all these different populations without having to potentially share that data specifically. And that's a very exciting area that I know large governmental systems are very interested in exploring. Finally is the people stuff. You need to have experts in all different areas to do this safely in practice. You need to have legal finance, you need to have quality, you need to have bioethicists, uh, computer scientists and clinicians all working together to make decisions. And what we do is we actually created a system where we have a scoring. So if we have 10 models that people want to put in our practice, we, we look at each one on these different categories and give them a score. And we don't allow a model that doesn't meet a certain score to, to be put into our practice. And we make sure that it's reassessed very, very closely because we know that the harm that can cause if the models aren't working appropriately. We've, uh, we've done this in a three-phase system that should be very familiar to you in other areas of, of computer science. Um, and we've organized this in a way that allows other healthcare systems to, to use the same approach. Very, very, very safe and effective ways to deploy these systems in our healthcare system to make sure they work. So in conclusion, um, these are some of our key learnings over the last six or seven years in this space. We feel that number one priority is building a multimodal model infrastructure, meaning you need to have a way to access your data, to use your data, and maybe that's in your hospital, maybe that's across your hospital, maybe that's at the government level, but you need to have a, a mechanism, whether it's cloud, whether it's on-prem, but someone needs to have a way to organize your data so you can get insights. We also believe very strongly in community. We need to have people from all different backgrounds learning about this, uh, this technology so that we can have conversations around where it can be used from different perspectives. So we focus on education and open science. When we build something, we want other people to know how it works. We want other people to try it. We want other people to build on it or tell us it doesn't work. That's how this field moves forward is by sharing our victories and our defeats at the same time. And then finally, we really prioritize clinical impact. So I don't wanna work on something that just ends in a paper. I want it to actually impact patients' lives. So I wanna make sure that what I'm building will actually drive real outcomes. So anyway, that's, that's kind of the overall system. It's a system that looks as a community 